That's fun out to be outdoors. Yeah. Come on, that's the church right there. You know, I, I, I kind of feel like Jesus right there. You know, as, as he talks to the crowd, you know, on the mountain right there outside in the park, amen. Yeah. You know, uh, it's so great to see you guys. It's awesome to see, you know, some new faces today. Uh, I'm told there's a guy called Ben who traveled all the way from Nottingham. He's at church today, guys. Yeah. Ben is at church, guys. Right, but he, you know, he's at church. Some disciples lived down the road. They came here late. <laughs> Struggling right there. I'm like, bro, this is kind of church, bro. It's just at the park, amen. Yeah, yeah. The title of the lesson today is simply Summer Surge. Yeah. Okay. okay, the title is Summer Surge, <laughs> not a summer dirge. <laughs> you know what a dirge is, right? Yeah, yeah sad song. Sad all the time. Right? Sad that it's hot. Sad coming to church. Sad singing. Okay? No, 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 no. That's not, that's not, that's not the title. The title is Summer Surge. Amen? Amen? The title is not Summer Purge. You know what a purge is, right? You know, the movie Purge, what happens is everyone waits for this day and all, all the sinners come out and everyone's just hiding in their homes. And, and that's how summer can be like nowadays. Summertime, everyone's sin just starts coming out. The clothes come out as well all of a sudden. I don't know what happens. And disciples come be hiding at home. We gotta be outside clothing them with righteousness right there, amen. That's what we gotta do. Not a summer purge. The title is not summer merge. Summer merge. You know, all, all of a sudden you, you, you lose your doctrines in the summertime. You stop merging, you know, you, just, you stop believing in discipleship. Summer surge. Not a summer splurge. <laughs> you know how it's like, summer splurge? You start spending more money than you ought to spend. You know how everyone's waiting for summertime, right? Spring break, right? All this stuff. No, you need a sin break. That's what you need right there. You need a sin break, become a disciple, get baptized, and go to GLC. Not Ibiza right there. Go to GLC. Sometimes you can have what is called a summer urge. You know how it is? Summer, you know, summertime, you, you get home. You want to be at home right there summertime, and you have the urge to eat food you ought not to eat right there. Summer urge, and you gain some weight. The title of the lesson today is Summer Surge, amen? amen. Now you ask, what, what's a surge, Frank? Well, surge isn't the name of a Russian guy, but surge is an English word right there. Surge means a sudden, powerful, forward, or upward movement, especially by a crowd. This says that when the church decides to go up, the church starts to move forward. We have what is called a summer surge. Come on, bro. Come on. And of course, the word sur surge comes from the Latin. It means to rise. And in a sense, when the sun comes out, basically says we're going to rise and shine as disciples. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Psalm chapter 74. On, Psalm 74. I hope you guys are fired up to hear the word of God today. You know, some of you guys are wondering, okay, what, what happened to the communion? Don't worry, we're having what is called a communion. Okay, okay. And so after the lesson, we are going to have our communion. On, Psalm 74. Let's go to the Psalms right there. Sometimes you got to go to the Psalms, guys. You know, you got to get, get in touch with your emotions right there. In Psalm 74, it says in verse 17, it says... It was you who set all the boundaries of the earth. You made both summer and winter. You know, guys, summer was made by God. God made summertime. He also made winter time. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 10. The wind is blowing. Don't worry. That's the Holy Spirit right there. In Proverbs chapter 10, oh, 
There it is. We are at Bible church, amen? amen? It says in Proverbs 10, in verse 5, He who gathers crops in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. You know, you can be, you know, there, there are two sons under the sun. <laughs> in the summertime, there's two different sons. You can be the wise son who gathers right there during the harvest time, or you can be the unwise son who is disgraceful and is sleeping during summertime. You gotta ask yourself, which son are you? And of course, if you're a woman of God, which daughter are you? <laughs> Those are the two you can be over here. Now, some cool facts about summertime. Can I share some cool facts about summertime? The Eiffel Tower actually grows in summertime. It grows. So because the heat, right, that the eye expands and it actually goes higher and higher. So every time, even the Eiffel Tower believes you got to go higher and higher in the summertime right there. You got to have a summer surge. Summertime, the first modern Olympics, right, Olympic Games right there. It's kind of interesting, of course, we have, you know, uh, the, 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 the games right there over here, the Commonwealth Games here in Birmingham, amen. amen. But, you know, in summertime, really and truly, the first modern Olympic Games in Greece were around summertime. That's when they had the games, around summertime in Greece, okay? Mosquitoes are the most prevalent during summer months right there. You, 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 gotta, you gotta deal with those mosquitoes right there, guys. They say the mosquitoes have been around over 30 million years on Earth. That's what they say. We don't know how long the Earth is right there, but there's some cool facts about summertime right there, amen? Joshua 10. Let's go to the Bible, guys. Joshua 10. Check this out over here. In Joshua 10, we read something over here. Now, of course, Joshua is, you know, the Hebrew of right there for, for Jesus. Joshua is the English, rather, for Jesus. And Joshua is a foreshadowing of Christ. In Joshua 10, it says something over here in verse 12. It says, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As is written in the book of Joshua, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Wow, wow that's a cranky miracle, guys. Yeah. Verse 14 says, there's never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Surely the Lord is fighting for Berea and the church says. Yeah. The longest day in the whole entire year is called the summer solstice. In the Latin, solstice is the word solstitium. It means sun stopping. This only happens once a year. And this says that this phenomenon never happened before Joshua and has never happened afterwards. You see, Joshua's prayer life created a scientific phenomenon. Today, we have the longest day right now called the summer solstice. Because Joshua prayed in Joshua chapter 10. Do you guys believe that your prayers can, can, can create a scientific phenomenon? Do you believe that? Let me tell you something, guys. It's a scientific phenomenon. I'm getting married right there. I, I don't know if you guys right there. The odds were against me. I'm telling you. It's a scientific phenomenon. If you don't believe in Jesus, just believe in that right there. One time, I prayed. I'm, I'm, this, I'm not lying. I prayed this prayer. I said, God, show me if I'm in sin. Okay. I don't, I don't know if you guys have ever prayed that prayer before. Yeah, yeah you, you, gotta, you gotta pray that prayer sometimes. You gotta know if you're right with the Lord. And uh, so I prayed. I said, God, show me if I'm in sin, okay? So I'm like expecting some, you know, something to happen right there. Nothing happened. So I go home. I'm at home. And I was preparing for a Bible talk lesson on riddles, okay? So I was looking at some riddles online and stuff like that. And then the first riddle that comes up, okay, is this. It said, what eight-letter word can have a letter taken away and still makes a word. Take another letter away 
S still makes a word. Keep going all the way down until you have one letter left. What is the word? So I was like, man, okay, what word could that be? What, what, what kind of word is it? So I click, of course, show answer. The word is starting. You take one, one, one letter away, uh, the second one is staring. Then you take another letter away, string. Another letter away, sting. Another letter away, sing. Another letter away, sin. <laughs> the second one, in. The last one, I. Oh my. I closed the internet, I went, I was like, I'm out of here, I'm, I'm mad. Sin and I. I was like, oh my goodness, God is speaking to me. Let me tell you something, man. God will listen to your prayers right there. You pray, he'll do something awesome. He'll speak to you right there, amen. Second Corinthians chapter 2, you guys still with me? Yeah. Summer surge. Man, I'm scared of praying the prayer right now. I'm just like, nope. I don't want to know. I'll find out on judgment day. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says something over here about Rome. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 16. You guys there? Oh, only, only three people are there. Oh, oh. In 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, he says this. But thanks be to God. Who always, you know, that's the word you want to use in marriage. I'm learning that one right there. Right? Always. <laughs> you always do this. Okay? But don't, don't use that word right there. It says, thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession. And uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God, the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we don't impel the word of God for profit. It says we don't believe in prosperity gospel right there. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. You know, Paul talks about, he says over here that God always leads us into triumphal procession. Do you believe that Christ is always leading you into triumphal procession? Yeah. Do you believe it? Yeah. Even through hardships, do you believe it? Yeah. Even through rejection, do you believe it? Yeah. Even through persevering through, you know, all, the, all these tough trials, do you believe that even in the midst of that time and moment, Christ is always leading you in triumphal procession. Yes. Now, what, what was a triumphal procession, you ask? Now, of course, you know, some of you guys may know that, okay, I'm going to teach you about what is called the, the, the Roman procession right there. Okay. Now, you might be saying, oh, well, Frank, there it is again. We already know what the triumphal procession is. No, we don't know. Right? And, 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 and you, 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 sometimes we can be like that, guys, as disciples. Oh, I heard that scripture again. Oh, that joke again. I heard that one before. Oh, Matthew 28 again. Oh, okay, we already know it. Oh, we know already. Right? If that's your heart, you're on a summer verge of falling away. That's what you are. That, that, that's, that's your summer. A summer verge of falling away. God's word is always speaking. All the time. Right? Now, what do you think God said to the Israelites every single time? I'm the God who took you out of Egypt. Every single time. Because they forgot. So sometimes I'm going to repeat some stories, I'm going to repeat some jokes, I'm going to repeat some scriptures because you're going to hear it again, amen? amen. Now, a triumphal procession, let's get into it. What was it? Now, of course, a triumphal procession was something the Romans would look forward to. It was a ritual procession that was the highest honor bestowed upon a victorious general in ancient Roman Republic, okay? Now, it, it, it was something that a Roman official was looking forward to, a, a Roman governor right there, a Roman, uh, you know, warrior. And you had to, for you to get a Roman procession, you had to, in a, in a way, claim victory and end the war as well. Not just get, you get to end the war in foreign soil. The captives you're going to bring with you isn't two captives, isn't a hundred captives, but 5,000 captives. When they send you out, you bring these 5,000 men with you 
they give you what is called a triumphal procession. And as they give you the triumphal procession, there's incense as well, okay? They would have their false priests go before uh, this Roman, uh, you know, governor right there, uh, commander rather, and they'll, 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 they'll spread incense all around. So people would smell the incense. Wow, they have victory. But then those who are captives will smell the incense like, wow, I'm about to get killed and I might die. And Christ says that as a disciple, you are the pleasing aroma that spreads all around the world. This says that Christians smell good. You smell good as a Christian. There, there is no Invictus, Lacoste, Poco Romani right there. No, no, you smell better than that as a disciple. Way better than that. But then what happens sadly is that the triumphal procession down the line, they stop honoring people with 5,000 spoils of war. They started giving it to anyone, just like that. Anyone could get a triumphal procession down the line. Pompey did it, of course, the various uh, um, you know, emperors did it as well. So sadly, what happened was it lost its value. But Christ said, no, 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 not as a disciple. Your triumphal procession has not lost value at all. And what would happen, of course, he says that to some people, the truth about Christianity smells good. When you come to someone with the truth of, about God, they're like, wow, thank you so much. You smell at me. Thank you for telling me I'm lost. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your faith with me. But to others, you smell like death. You stink to some other people. Your joy, your positivity, your, your, your perseverance, you sharing the faith with them, you smell like death to some of them right there. True story, back in London, I was on the train and uh, I saw this guy read his Bible. And I was like, wow, I, I, I haven't seen anyone else in, in London read their Bible as well. And he had, a, he had a cross chain as well. So I said, okay, you, know, you, got, you got to share your faith with that person, right? Yeah. You see someone like that, you're like, oh, man, I've been sinning to share my faith. I'm not lying when I say this, okay? So I see him, I go to him, I sit next to him. I try to, of course, be, you know, slick with it, right? I touch the guy. Oh, wow. Touch him. <laughs> I'm not playing. That was literally what he did. I'm not, I'm not lying, guys. I'm serious. I touched him, don't touch me. And he got off the train. I was like, wow, what kind of spirit do you have? It was like a horror movie. You know how it's like in a horror movie, you touch, I was like, man. That's an evil spirit right there. My Bible's all over the place. And why do I start with the scripture, guys? The triumphal procession would take place in the spring and summertime. Because summertime and spring was a time when kings would go off to war. You see, summertime is when you get your triumphal procession, guys. That's when you get your triumphal procession. But another thing I'm fascinated about in summertime is something called the Great Migration. <laughs> Who knows what the Great Migration is over here? Okay, all right, okay, the Africans know that one right there. Now, what is it? The Great Migration is simply... It, it, it describes, it literally, people say that it, it's, a, it's one of Earth's greatest shows. Yeah. Literally, it's described as the Earth's greatest, just greatest event. There's no event like it. So what happens? Millions of, you know, zebras, wildebeests, and other antelopes and species of that kind, they make what is called this incredible journey all across uh, Tanzania, Kenya, all, all, all that side right there. They do it every single year. And as they go, they face crocodiles, infested waters, terrestrial predators like lions and leopards along the way. But they got to do it. When they stay in one place, all of them die. But they got to go on this great migration all around East Africa. They got to move. See, the animal kingdom believes in moving. They believe in moving. They believe in migrating. And I hope the great migration doesn't become what is called the great frustration. Frustrated, you got to move. Frustrated, you know, we're not having church inside the mag, we're having outside of it here. Frustrated. When it comes to moving, you always have to ask yourself these questions. Are you moving forward? Are you standing still? Or are you falling behind? Which one are you? Speaking of summer, I do have some questions as well. 
What did the beach say to the tide when it came in? Nice. Long time no see. Long time no see. Long time no see. What did the reporter say to the ice cream? What's the scoop? What's the scoop? What's the scoop right there? Why don't mummies ever take a summer vacation? They are afraid to unwind. Mummies, they're afraid to unwind. I got a few more, gonna get a few more right there for summertime. Okay. What kind of tree fits in your hand? A palm tree, amen. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, you guys are catching up right there. The sun's coming out, you guys are remembering some stuff, okay? What do you do if you get rejected for a job at the sunscreen company? Reapply. Reapply. Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Matthew 28. I hope you guys are not bored of Matthew 28. I'll tell you what it says. Matthew 28, first point is simply, it's time to move from your mountain. It's time to move from your mountain. Matthew 28, the last words of Jesus over here, very important words. And we'll, we'll look into it over here. Matthew 28, verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee. Right? 11. It, it, it makes it, uh, uh, it, it says something, guys. Now you got to understand something. You got to believe that every single word of God, every word in the word of God is there for a reason. Yeah. You can imagine the author. You can imagine Matthew writing this right now. It's like, man. 11 disciples. Why? Judas fell away. Right. It, 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 was, it said something, guys. It's like, man, there's only 11 left. If only Judas stayed faithful. If only Judas stayed faithful for one more week. He'd be used to write the scriptures you read today. You see, loyalty pays off. I, I want to let you know that you being loyal to God is going to pay off. Judas had no idea. He's like, no, I'm going to break faith. I'm going to break my faith from Jesus Christ. And guess what happened? He died. When you break away your faith from, um, from Jesus, you die. It kills you. You die when you, when you break faith away from Jesus. He says the 11 disciples over here went to Galilee. We're going we're gonna to look into this very uh, deeper later on. To the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. See, Jesus tells you which mountain you're going to go to. You don't pick your own mountains. You don't decide, okay, I want to go to that mountain, that mountain. No. He tells you which mountain to go to. And we know that mountains symbolize the kingdoms and nations. So you, you don't decide, you don't dictate, okay, I got to move. No. God tells you when to move. God tells you where to go as well. He says to the mountain, where you told him to go. Now check this out. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Let's look at something in, de in depth over here. In Deuteronomy chapter 1. Now the word Deuteronomy is known as the second law. Deuteronomy is actually a sermon. It's actually a sermon. People say that Moses gave Deuteronomy as a re repetition because they were, they, were, they were not listening. It was like, okay, I got I to preach the whole entire law to you guys all over again. The second law, repetition. And when you think about it, some people are like, oh, well, repetition, okay, repeat the law again, stuff like that. No, no. Deuteronomy is arguably one of the most incredible books in the Bible. Why? When Christ was being tempted by Satan, he didn't use Genesis, he didn't use Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, he used Deuteronomy. All the three scriptures he used to defend himself against Satan was Deuteronomy. That's what he used. The repetition. He says, this is the one that you're going to use against Satan. 
Deuteronomy. You guys there? In verse 1, it says something over here. It says, these are the words of Moses. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. That is in the Arabah, opposite of Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Disahab. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. Okay, you guys see that, right? Say so it takes 11 days. Verse 3. In the 40th year. <laughs> 40th year. He says, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. This was after he had defeated Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Hashbon. And at Edrei had defeated Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth, east of the Jordan in the territory of Moab. Moses began to expound this law, saying, The Lord our God says to us at Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Yes. <laughs> you stayed long enough. Oh, Move. Oh. Break camp. Oh. Break camp. Advance into the hill country. Oh. An 11 day journey took 40 years. Why? They were about to go into the promised land. And Jesus, God rather, had to, in a way, destroy the generation. That was faithless. Here he says, guys, it just takes 11 days just to get there. But because of your faithlessness, it's now taking 40 years. 40 years. 11 days. And God had to get rid of that faithless generation. It took 40 years to get all the faithless people. Okay, now, now you got faith. Let's go. You know, the reason why certain things take so long is because you lack faith. Yep. You lack faith. A short journey, can, can you, you can prolong a short journey because of your faithlessness. Some of you say, well, I need a year to become a Christian. No, you don't. No, you don't. I always, say people, I always ask people this question. I say, hey, when you're studying the Bible with people, I said, think about your favorite athlete. You know, of course, you know, the, the, the football players, I say, think about Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo. Now, that dude's a beast. Yeah. Everyone, even if you don't like sports, sisters are like, hey, man, yeah, Cristiano, he's, he's an awesome player right there. I don't know who he is, but I've heard a lot of stuff about him. <laughs> and I say to people, I say, look, what if you had two options? You had seven days to become like Cristiano Ronaldo, or you had a whole year to become just like him. Which path would you take? <laughs> Easy, seven days! Okay, then why do you want to take your time to become like Jesus? He's better than Cristiano Ronaldo. He's the most perfect man in the whole entire world. But yet when it comes to Jesus, it's going to take 40 years to become a disciple. When you can become a disciple just like that in seven days. Your faithlessness is what stops you. Your baptism can take 40 years because of your lack of faith. You can prolong your baptism because of uh, lack of faith. Let's go back to Matthew 28 right there, amen? Let's go back. And you got to ask yourself, how long will you stay at that mountain? How long? Just how long? How long? And you got to understand something. Moses over here, he's in Mount... <laughs> he's, he's on the mountain. He's on the mountain. And he's like, man, I got to... People say that Deuteronomy, compared to Numbers, the difference... Remember again, Deuteronomy is a sermon. Okay? He was reiterating the law as a sermon. And they say that the heart that Moses had was a heavy and passionate heart. He was, he was sad. Why? Because he was on Mount Horeb and he could see the promised land and he couldn't go in. He was so sad. I wish I could go in. I got to give this sermon to these people as they go in to the promised land. 
And that's why as he gives the sermon, it's, it's, it's a passionate one. It's from the heart. It's heavy. And you could be like that. You could be just watching everyone go to heaven. Just watching everyone get baptized. Just watching. Watching everyone go to heaven. But you're just staying up on that mountain. Matthew 28. Let's go back. Matthew 28. You guys with me, right? Yep. You guys haven't fallen asleep on me right there, right? The sun has not sapped your strength, has it not? Matthew 28. Now, verse 16, he says, The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. This is interesting. Now, when you read further up in Matthew 28, in verse 7, okay, it says, Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him, now I have told you. Now you gotta, I'll just, you gotta, you gotta think, okay, why? Why Galilee? <laughs> Jesus Christ was already in Jerusalem. The disciples were already in Jerusalem. Why did he tell them, meet me in Galilee? At that specific mountain. The, the mountain, of course, over here, all right, that he's talking about over here, some say it was the mountain where Jesus Christ was transfigured. That's what they say, because this mountain allowed you to see Israel. It allowed you to see Jerusalem. It gave you an amazing view of Jerusalem. The journey between Jerusalem to Galilee was three days. And then when you get to Galilee, on that mountain, it, it, was, it was a pretty intense mountain. You had to, you had to go up on that mountain. Yeah. So you're like, okay, why? Why was Jesus saying, okay, um, instead of meeting here right now, why got to meet in three days? Take a three-day journey, go up all the way to Jerusalem, go all the way, no, sorry, to Galilee, and go up on this mountain. I'll tell you why. Because the New Testament began in Galilee. Galilee, you had what is called the first disciples. Galilee was where the disciples got their purpose. Galilee was where the disciples got their vision. And Christ says, I want to start something new. I want to have what is called the Christian surge. And for us to have the surge, we're going to go back to the beginning in Galilee. See, Galilee wasn't just a place, it was a, it was a state of mind. Wow. It was a state of, it was like, you, you guys got to go back. So when, when the disciples went back three years later, they're like, man, you guys remember? <laughs> this is where we were called. And Christ, of course, over here, he gives what is called the Great Commission, because he's starting something new, a movement. He's like, it's going to start in Galilee again. Now it says, of course, over here, that some saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. You know, the word doubt is distazo in the Greek. It means having a double stance. You have two opinions about Jesus. All right, two opinions. That's not a good place to be. Now we read, uh, uh, carry on, verse 18. You guys are with me, right? Verse 18 says, And Jesus came to him and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make supporters. Go and make some fans, right? Yeah, you see, fans, they attend, but they don't play. They just come to church, they don't make disciples, they just come. They're fans. They sing along the songs, they're fans. Go and make benefactors of all nations. Right, just give them money, right? That's all I gotta do, pay my contribution, that's it. I'm good to go, I, I've done my Christianity, no. It says, go make what? Disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This says that you cannot get baptized unless you've been made into a disciple of Jesus. If you've been baptized as a non-disciple, you're lost. You're lost. You cannot be baptized right and taught wrong. You cannot. You cannot. You can be, okay, I was baptized, okay. No, the wrong doctrine, no. You got to be taught right and baptized right. Verse 20, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you and show them with the all race to the very end of the age and the church says. Amen. Here it says, if you're not making any disciples, you're not a disciple. You're a fan, you're a benefactor, you're a supporter. Disciples got to make disciples. And of course, over here, he's got 11 guys. 
And he's like, I, I don't want just 11 to make it to heaven. I don't want just 11 to make it to heaven. He wants more guys to make it to heaven. Let's go to John 18. You guys still with me? Yeah. Since I might have to cut this sermon short right there. No. No. I feel like I might have to cut this sermon short. John 18. John 18 says something over here. In John 18, it says in verse 38, What is truth? We know the word of God is the truth, amen? amen. So if you're here today wondering what is the truth, the Bible is the truth. Right. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. And of course, over here it says that Barabbas, the people wanted Barabbas because he, he, he was a guy who was kind of bringing, he was trying to bring a surge <laughs> of trying to, you know, free the Jews, basically. Right? And he says over here that he was, he, he taken part in an uprising. The ESV says he was a robber. The Berean, the Berean Bible study says he was an insurrectionist. The NASB says he was a rebel. The NLT and many other translations say he was a revolutionary. What, what is a revolutionary, you ask? Someone who causes a revolution. Pretty straightforward. What's a revolution? A forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. That's a revolution. So Barabbas over here was called a revolutionist. Do you guys hear about Barbara's movement today? Yeah. Exactly, you don't. Acts 21. Acts 21. Some surge. Let's look, let's look at some people in the Bible who tried to create a surge. Acts 21, it says over here in verse 37. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, in the barracks rather, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. Of course, over here you got this guy, this Egyptian, who was called a revolutionist as well. And he said he led 4,000 people into the desert. And do you hear about this guy's movement? No. Dead. Silence. That's what happens when you follow a, a, a non-man of God. He leads into the wilderness and you die. Acts chapter 5. Come on, Frank, where are you getting with this? Oh, don't worry, I'm going somewhere. Come on, bro. Keep going, bro. I'm going somewhere. I'm ready, Acts chapter 5. In verse 36. Says some time ago, the elders appeared, claiming to be somebody. That's how the world is. They always claim to be someone, they're not. Right? Claiming to be somebody. And about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed. And it all came to what? Nothing. Nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt, a revolution. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. You see that? Everyone was trying to start a movement, a revolution. But once the leader died, the people also died as well. I hope that's not going to be the church in Birmingham. When the leader gets taken away, the people start scattering. The people start dying. Nope. Now, of course, we see something over here. This is what happens. Of course, it carries on, rather. It says, verse 38, Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you'll not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourselves fighting against God. You see, many individuals 
have tried to create a surge in life. But they fail because they don't have God with them. Christ began a Christian surge in Galilee. And it still speaks volumes today. We are part of that movement today. And the reason why this revolution still stands today is because it's a movement, not of man, but it's a movement of God. The question you've got to ask yourself today is simply, will you join the Christian summer surge? Will you join the Christian summer surge? Because when they went up to Galilee, it was actually around spring, summertime. It doesn't say it was winter, it was spring, summertime. And Christianity began in the hot season. A summer surge, which changed the whole entire world. You see, you can join every other movement that's out there, but it's all going to die. Because God's not there. And you can decide to join the Christian revolution today. Because that's still existing, and it's still functioning, and it's still working, and still changing lives to this very day. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 12, you guys are with me. Amen. Hebrews 12, bring it for a close. Don't worry, guys. Okay, hang in there. I know you guys are getting hungry right there. Don't worry about that. Get hungry for the word of God. Hebrews 12, second point is simply, can you take the heat? Can you take the heat? Seriously, can you take the heat? Right now we're in the sun. Can you take the heat? Can you take the heat? Rob's like, no, man. I want winter time. Can you take the heat? Right? We know the phrase, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Christianity is fire, guys. The Bible, we're going to read very soon right now what, what kind of God we serve. Okay? It's about fire. And if you can't stand the heat, you've got you to get out of the kitchen. Mm. Hebrews 12, it says in verse 18, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words, that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Even Moses says, I'm trembling with fear. Verse 22. But ye have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in sad assembly, right? No. It says in joyful assembly. To the church, the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. Your, your names are written in heaven, guys. Amen. You have come to the God, the judge of all, that says who's going to judge you. To the spirit of the righteous made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This says your blood can speak. Your blood can speak. It says the sacrifice of Jesus, his blood, Speaks better than the blood of Abel. What's your blood going to say about you when you die? What's it going to say about you? What's going to be the blood message you're going to have after you die? Would you make an impact? Or everyone will just move on? What blood message would you have? He says over here. Now check this out, of course. It goes all the way down, verse 28. Therefore... Since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Fire only begins when it's ignited. ignited. Fire begins when it's ignited. Summer produces what is called heat waves. That's what someone produced, a, a heat wave. We, we need a heat wave. Yep. You know, I, I live with a brother in my house where <laughs> when you're walking into his room, it's a heat wave. On, yes, who's that? Joseph Perisher right there. <laughs> Joseph's room is a heat wave. You walk in that room, you get blasted with some heat right there. And I'm like, bro, are you not hot? He's got all zipped up. He's like, no, bro, I'm feeling cold. And if you walk into this guy's room, he, 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 he's got plants all over his room, right? It's like, I'm like, bro, this is a tropical jungle right here. What's going on over here? Like, here the monkeys in the background. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm like, bro. 
It's got like tropical island right there, trying to make his home like a Philippines right there. A heat wave. We're the heat wave. We're the heat wave of studies. Yes. We're the heat wave of baptisms. Yes. We need a heat wave of hot Bible studies. Amen. Hot Bible studies. Yes. If you're here today visiting yeah. and you're on that mountain taking 40 years, you know the hot Bible study. Uh -oh. You're a cold Bible study. Ooh. And you need to become hot. You need to become hot. A hot Bible study, 11 days, bang. That's who you can become. You can become an hot just like that. Heat wave. Someone tell us about hot studies. Now, you, you, you understand some of fire, guys. Fire doesn't start out of nowhere. It needs three things. Okay, the scientists may agree on, on this one. You need oxygen, heat, and fuel. Okay, there we go. Amen. Okay. You take one away, fire doesn't exist. It's like the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You can't, you can't have a relationship with just one. You need all. You need all to have a fiery relationship with God. Fire is wild. Fire is unplanned. Fire is unwanted. And fire is uncontrolled. See, God's the same way. He comes into your life not according to your plan. You don't plan. You don't, you don't, I don't know about you guys. I didn't plan to become a disciple. He just fire. Whoa. Some people don't want God. Same as fire. You don't want fire. Some people don't want God. And you cannot control God. That's why God's like a fire. Comes in, disrupts everything. Sometimes you don't want him. He's too hot. And sometimes you want to try and control him. You can't control God. You can't. He's fire. He's fire. He came into my life, disrupted everything in my life. Everything. You, you guys heard my story last week. I want to become a personal trainer. That's what I want to do. Okay, I wanted to, you know, help people physically right there. God's like, no, I'm going to come into your life, fire, destruct everything. You become a spiritual personal trainer right there. That's what you're going to become. Come on. See, fire, God's a fire. He's going to disrupt everything. Fire is often associated with the qualities of boldness, passion, and energy. Fire doesn't ask any questions. Fire doesn't say, oh, can I burn you? Is it okay? Is it all right? Can I just burn you a little bit? Oh, is it, so was it too much? I'm sorry. Let me just tone down my fire a little bit. Nah. Let me just decrease my heat. See, fire is always hot. Always. Yeah. Always hot. Don't become chill Bill. Don't become chill Bill. <laughs> you don't mean chill Bill. Don't become complacency Stacy. Don't become that. Fire is always hot. You know, one time I almost nearly burned down my flat. <laughs> nearly burned down my flat. I thought it was a nightmare, but it, it was a dream. No, it was real. <laughs> Almost burned down my flat. I was trying to make some food right there. I forgot the food. I got distracted by video games, you know. And before you know it, the whole kitchen was in black. It was black. I was oh my goodness. And, you know, of course, I was like, you know, 15 at that time. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get a fiery beating right there. So I got a fiery beating when I got home, when my mom got home. <laughs> you know what's dangerous about someone who's on fire for God? He lights everyone up as well. He lights everyone up as well. We need a heat wave. You know what can kill your fire? First Samuel chapter 3. Bring it for close. First Samuel 3, guys, okay? Just a simple message for you guys. Nothing convicting at all. Nothing challenging at all. Just, just, just simple. In First Samuel chapter 3, Let's see what kills your fire. In verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. Who was Eli? Overweight preacher. Overweight. He had a summer urge. The urge to eat a whole bunch of stuff during summertime. Eli had sons. Eli had sons who, were, who, who had no regard or respect for God. That's the leader he had. And Samuel cranked under that leader. Yep. You see, we, we like, oh, I, I, we want a, a different leader. No, pray for your leader. Right. Yeah. Pray for the one you have. Yeah. Yeah.
Stop being critical of the leader you know. Pray for the leader you have. Help the leader you have. Right? You cry. And the, and the Eli. Look what happened over here. It says, in those days, the word of the Lord was? Woo! There were not many? Woo! That's what can kill your fire. No vision. No vision. Now, of course, over here, the Hebrew says for vision, it means it wasn't breaking forth. It, it wasn't having a surge in, in Israel. It wasn't breaking to people's hearts and minds. So when, when God's word isn't, isn't breaking forth in your heart, you lack vision. Mm, wow. That's what happens when you, when you don't have visions because you're not close to God. God's word is not penetrating. Right? You, you have the summer verge, right? That, that, you know, oh, I'm used to the scripture again. There it is again. Samuel, we already know what's happening. Hannah, oh, we know already. Right? In verse 2 it says, One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see. Okay? Now you understand something. In the Bible, remember again, every word in the Bible is very precious. It's there for a reason. So it says Eli's eyes were weak. Sometimes this refers to a spiritual state. His eyes were weak. That's why there's not many visions. He, he was doing terrible spiritually. It says he could barely see. He was lying down in his what? Usual place. Oh, wow. The lamp of God had not gone out. It's like, man, it's about to go out, but it hasn't gone out yet. There's still, there's still some light. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. You see, Eli was lying down in his usual place and didn't hear anything from God. Wow. Whereas Samuel was in the presence of God and he heard God speak to him. See, what kills your fire is usual. Usual quiet times. Usual prayer. Usual prayer spot. Usual contribution. Just usual. Nothing special at all. And when you're in the usual place, you don't hear, you don't hear anything from God. Whereas Eli was, was Samuel was in the house of God and God spoke to him. And I, I like this because there's a distinction between Samuel and Eli. And God speaks to him, of course, over here. You can read this in your own time, but for time's sake, I won't go into it. But it carries on and on. And Samuel over here, of course, over here, he hears from God. And he has what is called the most challenging challenge any young spiritual leader has to do. Tell his spiritual father that you're lost. How about that for your first task as a disciple? Go share your faith with this guy and tell him he's lost. And he, he had to, that was his first sharing his faith. That was his first sermon. <laughs> Go tell your spiritual dad he's going to hell. <laughs> so, dad, whoa. And he kept it, of course, from him. Right? Simply, Samuel desired to be closer to God than Eli did. And because he desired that presence with God, he had vision and God spoke to him. And his fire didn't die out. God wants his word to spread throughout Birmingham. God wants Birmingham to have vision. God wants you to have vision. In closing, what type of summer will you have? What type of summer will you have, disciples? Will you have a summer with Jesus or without Jesus? Jesus. And how long will it take you to become a Christian? Seriously, how long will it take you? You know, will you, will you stay on that mountain for 40 years? Or will it take you just a week to become a, a true Christian? Which movement will you join? There are lots of movements that are out there. Which one will you join? <laughs> The Christian movement is the only one that's been surging since years ago, 2,000 years ago to this very day. All the others are dying and are dead already. Are you still on the same mountain? And the reason why you're not moving is because you lack faith. You know what mountain you're on. You know what mountain that God's been telling you to move from. And the only way you can come out of that mountain is by faith. Have you lost vision? And we know you lose vision because you're not in the Word of God. I, I challenge you to have awesome quiet times. Yes. Not just just read no awesome quiet times. Like I, I mean quiet times that produce joy inside of you. Yes. Come on, let's go. 
quiet times like like yeah, like Dan Latigo right there. Do you, do you guys read your Bibles? Or is this a quick thing? Microwave, microwave kind of quiet times. You know how microwave is, two minutes, that's it. Is that your quiet time? Is this your, is this your quiet time? Is this your quiet time? We had a day in Diva on Friday and we had a, we had a, we had a skit of a bad date. And the brother, you know, on the date, was inviting the sister, and the sister said, oh no, I gotta wait to have my quiet time. The brother said, I am your quiet time. I hope that's not disciples today. That D times are your quiet times, church service are your quiet times, meetings are your quiet times. No. You, you, you've lost vision because, yeah, you read the same scripture, oh, same, I already know, I already know it already. I already know it. Yeah. And uh, uh, you're, not, you're not allowing God to speak to you and because you're, you're not where the ark of God is. Wow. Have awesome quiet times and have awesome prayers. You got to speak to God. God wants to speak to you. And last but not least, we got to fall deeply in love with God. Let's have a summer surge. I love you and to God be the glory. Yeah.